Hello, um, I just want to welcome everyone here to our presentation on the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm in the last year of my PhD here. And today we'll be exploring different stories, different journeys, to kind of give you a sense of what we're about, what we care about, and what kind of challenges we like to take on as a department. So I thought I could start by just starting with my own story. So I did my undergraduate degree at U of T Scarborough in biology. And I remember when I was in my fourth year, I was trying to figure out you know, what the next stage would be. You know, what am I going to do? Uh, well, you know, the world was really big, and I, you know, there were so many things to do, I just didn't know where to begin. And, um, but what I did know is that I wanted to be part of something that was meaningful, and I wanted to help people. So naturally, I was considering something like medicine. But I felt that gaining a deeper understanding to biology, to disease, to patient care would ultimately make me a better physician. So when I was considering graduate school, you know, LMP really stood out for me um, because I felt, you know, the department was not too small and it wasn't really too big, but I felt it was the right size because I wanted to meet cool people, and I wanted to interact with them. I came from U of T Scarborough. I wanted something that had that sense of community. But I also wanted to be part of meaningful science. And I felt that that's something that I could do here. So that ultimately brought me to a project working with Rod Bremner, uh, who's at Mount Sinai Hospital. He's an LMP faculty member. And he basically tasks me with this a project to prevent heritable cancer. Um, so unlike, unlike uh, sporadic cancer, heritable cancer is usually linked or initiated by a single mutation. And because of that, we can have an idea about the timing and the pathogenesis. We can predict these things. So my project is in a particular kind of eye cancer called retinoblastoma. And we originally identified these two factors which are important for its initiation. So I basically had to take that basic discovery and make it so that a doctor could use it in the clinic. So I made these little targeted eye drops and that block transformation in normal cells, and they ultimately block cancer. Uh, so we're in the process now of translating that. Uh, we're working together with a company in the UK. Uh, we've talked to lawyers, we've worked in different hospitals, we've collaborated with people at Stanford, Harvard. Uh, we worked with people at CCBR here in Toronto, McMaster. And it's been a really exciting experience because you're seeing a lot of different, uh, a lot of different people and in, in being involved. So if, at the end of the day, my journey in LMP has taught me a lot about being part of something bigger and how to impact something in healthcare. And while my originally, uh, original idea was maybe pursuing medicine, I really underappreciated the kind of excitement of working with you know, cool, brilliant, diverse minds. So right now, I'm considering something along the lines of practice consulting. And so we're here today to hear these kinds of stories, um, the cool and exciting stories that take place here in the Laboratory of Medicine and Pathobiology. So we have, up next, um, Dr. Kareem Mikhail, who's a Canada Research Chair and faculty member here at LMP. Without further ado. All right, thank you, Sean, for the kind introduction. It is really a pleasure to be here today and to tell you a little bit about uh, what we do and how Tiny Yeast uh, is helping us solve big health problems for uh, us humans. Uh, so in my lab, we ask a number of fundamental questions. Uh, we ask, why do we age? Why do we age differently? Are there genes that control aging? Uh, would such genes be affected by the human experience? For example, are my genes affected uh, by this particular presentation I'm doing here or by my environment? Are there connections between aging and age-related diseases such as cancer and neurodegenerative diseases? And ultimately, the goal is to address this question is how can we stall the bad aspects of aging and abolish age-related diseases. So in my lab, we use uh, a couple of uh, genetic systems. Uh, we employ in particular combination of yeast and human genetic models. 
So the reason for this combination is that most of the really important uh, genes and cellular processes uh, that are important for life are shared between yeast and human. So yeast cells uh, have an advantage though over our human cells is that they can be rapidly grown and are easily modified uh, to delete or manipulate genes. So if you have a gene you want to see if it's important, it's very easy to get rid of that gene and see how things change in the cell. Then our findings in yeast are translated to human systems where we typically end up finding the same fundamental processes, but of course with some uh, differences. And we're finding that for the types of questions that we're asking, this is really helping us accelerate uh, discoveries. So once, we, uh, once certain genes are identified in uh, various diseases by sequencing uh, samples from patients, uh, the, we move along this discovery wheel here in my lab where uh, we assess the function of the gene in yeast, confirm it in human cells, then we end up going back and forth between the yeast and the human systems uh, to dissect the function of that gene a little bit more, and then we move into multicellular models such as mice, and also uh, assess samples uh, that are coming from patients. And the goal here is that we keep feeding this wheel uh, further and further, and through these multiple rounds or cycles, we can really dissect the, the important functions for disease-related genes. So don't take my word for it. Uh, yeast is actually important for human uh, biology and health. So here's a list of some of the discoveries, or Nobel Prize-winning discoveries, I should say. Uh, that actually uh, were in large part due to yeast genetics. And uh, while you may or may not be familiar with these uh, discoveries here that are listed, hopefully you'll appreciate at least that uh, they have had a huge impact on our understanding of aging, cancer, how cells are dividing, how our muscles are functioning, and pretty much everything uh, uh, that we, that's happening inside of our human bodies. So what are the types of stories or discoveries that came out of our approach to uh, biomedical discovery? I'm gonna tell you uh, just a little bit of a couple of stories. In this first one, uh, it turns out that our DNA is non-randomly arranged in the nucleus, which is actually defined by a nuclear envelope. Uh, and we found that uh, this critical to this non-random organization of the genome inside the nuclear envelope is the attachment of key pieces of the DNA, shown here, uh, to this nuclear envelope by conserved protein complexes. And uh, so this is true in healthy individuals. Now in premature aging patients, uh, or kids uh, in some cases, what you see is that the, you lose the function of these tethering complexes and the DNA is released from the envelope. This leads to the collapse of the entire genome and this is actually thought to be a major driver, not just in premature aging, uh, as you see here in, in this particular uh, child, but also in uh, how we are aging naturally. So in the next story, uh, that I'm going to tell you about, actually uh, it has to do with, um, I'm going to talk about amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So a ALS has been in use a lot uh, lately because um, of the ice bucket challenge as well as uh, the movie um, about uh, Stephen Hawking. So um, what did we actually find here that's informing uh, or changing our understanding of ALS? So it turns out it's actually a very fundamental discovery about what's happening in the cell. So <clears throat> what I'm showing you here is an early stage of gene expression. So here you have the DNA in these two shades of blue, and this big blue enzyme is synthesizing RNA. And critical to uh, the RNA floating away from the DNA is that the RNA needs to be recognized by this protein here called ataxin 2. And this allows the RNA to float away from the DNA and for proper gene expression to occur. So what we found in that in cells lacking this ALS-linked ataxin-2 gene, 
the RNA is actually misguided or lacking guidance, and it's not able to float away from the DNA. Instead, it gets stuck on the DNA behind the enzyme, and this actually stalls uh, gene expression. So students in my lab were the major drivers behind uh, the stories I told you about, and how did they disseminate the research results? So some of the, uh, or most of the results are published in scientific journals, and we typically aim for impactful scientific publications, including uh, top journals such as Nature Journal, Cell Journals, and other leading open access journals. Uh, students also give several presentations. These could be local, national, or international. And we are actually quite lucky in LMP that uh, we have these uh, LMP-specific travel awards that make it easier for supervisors like myself to send my students to more and more of these expensive international conferences. And as Sean alluded to earlier, we, there's also another way of disseminating uh, research findings through patents and um, intellectual property rights. So our LMP faculty and students have consistently uh, won uh, several prestigious uh, awards and scholarships. So our faculty, we have several faculty who are Canada Research Chairs, uh, CIHR New Investigator awardees or holders, and uh, also several of our faculty members receive field, top field-specific uh, specific prizes, such as the Manpei Suzuki uh, Diabetes Prize. Our students are doing exceptionally well. Uh, we have um, students winning all sorts of scholarships and awards, including the highly prestigious uh, Vanny Doctoral Scholarships. And we also have both faculty and students who, are, uh, who have received the Canada Governor General Gold Medal, which is typically awarded to the top uh, graduating doctoral students at uh, Canadian uh, universities. So what's the path to success in LMP? So once you're admitted in our department, uh, you are gonna work closely with the supervisor as well as committee members to both plan for and conduct your research. And this will eventually uh, lead you to uh, uh, achieving a number of publications and receiving a number of awards. Then you're gonna write and defend your thesis and graduate and choose the next step of your career. So where are some of my former lab members uh, today? So they really uh, are choosing highly diverse uh, set of careers. So I have several students who are in the academic research uh, branch. Uh, some of them are postdoctoral fellows, others are research associates and so on. And they're in prestigious universities including Toronto, Stanford, and McGill. Uh, some of my students are also uh, in the biotech or biopharma industry at the moment. Some are uh, contemplating becoming scientific editors. Um, and one of my former undergraduate students is actually a CEO of his own biotech startup company, and I'm really rooting for him. It's quite a challenge to establish a company from scratch. We also have several students who uh, combine the knowledge that they gain in our department and in bio biological sciences and with uh, professional degrees such as medicine, law, and dentistry. So with that, I'm gonna thank you uh, for your attention, and I'm gonna introduce our next speaker. So it is really a pleasure to introduce Dr. Michelle Bendick, who is professor and research director in our Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kareem, and thank you everyone for being here today and attending. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about the department in general and a little bit about my lab and some of the things that we do in the lab. So we're really involved in LMP in a wide spectrum of research, and it's all centered on answering questions in experimental and clinical pathology. The techniques we use encompass biochemistry, physiology, immunology, molecular genetics, and even bioengineering. So we really offer everything that other basic science departments offer, but falling under the larger umbrella of understanding the mechanisms of human disease and pathogenesis. 
LMP has nine research areas, which we've um, grouped people into thematic research groupings. Um, the most popular and populous of these areas include cancer research, infectious diseases, neuroscience, and cardiovascular disease. My research, in fact, focuses on cardiovascular disease, in particular, on atherosclerosis. This is an inflammatory and fibrotic disease of blood vessels, and in fact, it affects over half of our population, so it's a clinically important disease. My lab is the Matrix Biology Lab, and we study how the extracellular matrix controls the biologic responses of cells in the vessel wall. To do this, we use molecular and cellular models, as well as animal models of disease, and our research really bridges these two areas. Recent work done by my grad students, Essera Digazel, Josh Lopez, and Amanda Mohabir, using mouse models of atherosclerosis, has identified a new and exciting role for a unique matrix protein, type 8 collagen, in mediating formation of the fibrous cap. And the fibrous cap is an important structure because it protects the cap and protects against plaque rupture. And in fact, plaque rupture is the most important cause, the most common cause of heart attacks. So we're also very excited that in new, more translational research that we've done, we've been able to show that type 8 collagen is expressed in the cap of human atherosclerotic plaques. So our work is not only important in mice. So my students over the years, there they are. Um, this is a relatively current picture of my research lab. But my students over the years um, have really been a great group to work with. Um, here's sort of a representation of a typical day in the Bendak lab. We do a lot of microscopy work, so we do a lot of experimental pathology, looking through the microscope at tissue samples. We also often have coffee breaks, and no doubt we're discussing, intensely discussing scientific discoveries in the lab at this coffee break. Uh, we also do some other activities. Um, this was a couple years ago. We participated in the protest march at Queen's Park, the Get Science Right protest march. And on a more fun note, we occasionally get out and do canoe trips and ski trips. So it's been a lot of fun to um, work with people, but also have a little bit of a life outside the lab with our lab group. Well, ultimately, for all the graduate students, it leads to the important process of convocation. And I'd li just like to show you pictures of a few of the people who've been in my lab over the years and tell you a little bit about where they are now. So Dr. Essera Digazel was a PhD student in my lab, and she has gone into biotech in a, the largest sense. She's now scientific, scientific director at LASIK MD. And she was actually brought on to help to train ophthalmology students um, to learn how to write papers and how to present their research and to write grants um, to, so that this um, very um, corporate entity is, uh, is establishing an increasing presence in the research environment. An MD-PhD student in my lab, Dr. Christopher Franco, uh, moved to UBC. He became a dad, a really, really cute little daughter here with his wife, Jenny. And he's currently in his first year in cardiology residency at UBC. And Chris actually continues to collaborate with the lab. He's um, doing work in collaboration with Bruce McManus at the University of British Columbia. And we've, in fact, um, are still publishing, um, ab publishing and presenting abstracts together. So Chris will hopefully stay in research. Dr. Peter Sabatini went from a PhD um, into a clinical genetics training program at the Hospital for Sick Kids, and he's currently working as a clinical lab laboratory geneticist there. And one of my current graduate students, Josh Lopez, will be graduating this summer, defending his thesis this summer, and he's just been accepted into Tyndale College, the teacher's college there. And Teachers College is actually a recurring theme in my lab. One of my former master's students, Bernard Ho, um, actually completed Teachers College before he joined the lab. And he went on to um, work up through the ranks and become a professor in liberal arts and sciences at Humber College. And he is currently a curriculum director there. So finally, um, like Karim, I do have a good example of a, an undergraduate student who's graduated and gone through the ranks. Um, Dr. Katie Rainer was one of our first LMP undergraduate pathobiology specialist graduates, and she's now a professor, an assistant professor at the University of Ottawa and at the U Ottawa Heart um, Institute. So, whoops, sorry. So I'll leave Bernard up here so everyone can enjoy his brilliant smile. Um, this was a Christmas party in the lab. Probably we're not supposed to do Christmassy things in the lab, but this was a number of years ago. Um, so we do a number of things to prepare our students for their next steps and to give them transferable skills that can be used in their future careers. 
So I'm a highly collaborative, I run a highly collaborative research program. I encourage my students to seek help from local and international experts. And also being at the top of my field and organizing and sharing meetings in my field, I make sure that my students get to meet and know the leaders in the field. So that helps them to establish connections for future job opportunities and training opportunities. I also seek out collaborators to make sure we're keeping up to date and uh, on top of the state of the art techniques to address our research questions. So we've recently been awarded an NIH grant together with labs from the University of Pennsylvania and Boston University. Um, and what we're doing is using nanotechnology to measure the mechanical properties of type 8 collagen in the vessel wall and in the atherosclerotic plaque. I think one of the best things about our graduate program as a whole is that we provide students with many opportunities to present their work. And this is done locally, within the department, at lab meetings, in graduate courses, nationally at meetings, and internationally. So um, I think this is one of the real strengths of our department, and um, they're encur encouraged and supported to attend conferences. Um, to prepare students in my lab, we rehearse presentations, so it's not uncommon for us to spend two plus hours rehearsing for a 20 minute talk. But this really leaves our students very well prepared and as a result, they go out and they win international presentation awards competing against the best labs in the world, students from the best labs in the world. So it's excellent preparation and it develops their communication skills and those things are really applicable for any future career. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for attending, for listening today, and I'd like to um, pass the microphone on and introduce Dr. George Sharmas. He's an assistant professor and director of the Molecular Diagnostic Lab at Mount Sinai Hospital, and he's also a former LMP graduate student, so one of our truly great success stories. Thank you, Michelle. So outside of my clinical duties, I co-supervise co an LMP uh, PhD student. Uh, I'm engaged in proteogenomic research uh, as well as molecular genetic research um, with direct clinical application. <clears throat> Within my clinical lab, uh, we process nearly 3,000 uh, patient samples per year for various genetic testing. One of, one of our uh, bread and butter tests or, or higher volume testing is sequencing of BRCA1 and 2 for patients with suspected inherited forms, um, the inherited form of uh, breast and ovarian cancer. And uh, recently we've implemented a new uh, method of detecting uh, mutations and, and pathogenic variants within BRCA1 and 2. It's called next generation sequencing. It's, uh, it, it affords us the potential of, of sequencing more than just the two genes, but many, many genes within many patients at the same time arguably a lot more sensitive than our current method, which is Sanger sequencing, our current gold standard, I would say. Um, my base knowledge that prepared me to push uh, the envelope of what we offer clinically um, to patients is rooted in my LMP education, without a doubt. I did both my master's and PhD in LMP, but prior to coming back to Toronto, I did my clinical molecular genetics postdoctoral fellowship at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Uh, I was lucky, I was selected as the only molecular fellow entering um, that year from countless applicants. Uh, but what made my application appealing to them was the translational work that I did within LMP. At Hopkins, I used to attend a genetics clinic and I would attend with world famous uh, clinical geneticists and uh, the daunting task of when they ask you a question, uh, that they're actually asking for your advice as a, as a laboratory um, a scientist and, and uh, a clinical um, colleague, it was pretty much the first time that I actually called upon all of my, my, my education. And it was, it was scary at first, but you know, it, was, it was rewarding in the end that you're actually facing a patient and you help those patients directly. Um, so I, it was those moments that I really realized that I was prepared, prepared well from my education here. Um, 97% of our graduates are employed or are pursuing further studies. Um, we help students to develop critical thinking skills and prepare, prepare them for a wide variety of careers. Academia, the biotechnology tech, um, and pharmaceutical industry, the nonprofit sector, healthcare, government, communications, consulting. Actually, since uh, 
Kareem brought it up with uh, the movie thing, I thought I would mention that while I was an LMP graduate student, I was fortunate to be a genetics con uh, consultant on a motion picture called Splice um, by Vincenzo Natale and featuring Sarah Pauly and um, Adrian Brody. And, uh, but the challenge in the role was actually had to, having to change the script to be much more realistic, and that's a very hard thing to do with, uh, with, the, <laughs> with the movie industry. Um, but I did have to call upon a lot of my lessons learned in my LMP lectures to try and take something that was really way out there and try and bring it halfway, meet them halfway. So um, that, was, uh, that was great. We have alumni who are completing their postdoctoral fellowships at the University of California, Harvard, MIT, and Stanford. Some of our alumni have titles such as professor at U of T's Department of Chem uh, Biochemistry, senior editor at Nature Medicine, marketing manager at Janssen Pharmaceuticals, Inc., clinical scientist at Boehringer uh, Ingelheim Limited, and the list goes on. So uh, we actually have uh, placed ourselves really well internationally. I'd now like to call upon our next uh, speaker, Richard Wu, who's an LMP student in the MD-PhD program. Hi, uh, thank you for that introduction, George. So my name is Richard. Um, I'm in the third year of the MD-PhD program, and I'm currently doing my PhD phase of my training in the department of LMP. So my professor is Dr. Philip Sherman, and I work at SickKids. And for my project, I'm looking at various ways to improve infant nutrition by studying the, invest, um, the interaction between different oligosaccharides and intestinal epithelial barrier function. So before I entered graduate school, I had a lot of anxiety about you know, what's about to come. Um, actually, the biggest fear for me was how to transition from being a medical student to now being a graduate student. Because from a clinical background, I didn't really have a lot of experience in basic science research. I didn't know how to do a Western blot. I didn't really know how to write a research proposal. And the biggest you know, challenge was where do I find help? But when I entered L LMP, I found that this was actually very easy for me to transition into the life of being a graduate student. To start, for the community life in LMP, it's phenomenal. There's tons of things happening. The community is very small, so you tend to know everybody on a first name basis, and it's very easy to pick up where your colleagues are good at, what they're doing for their projects, and set up collaborations and seek help. Apart from that, it's a very friendly and collegial environment, and we also have a lot, a lot of activities and social events where students can participate. For example, when I entered, there was an annual barbecue at the Central Island where we got a chance to mingle with the faculties and students and incoming um, students in that year. And I got a chance to meet a lot of friends, and there was tons of great food and tons of activities you can participate in. So these are just some pictures that we took from the barbecue. So for example, here we have the water balloon throwing contest, and it was just a good way for us to meet the colleagues and build a lot of friendships in this uh, department. Because I think what we have to realize is that during graduate school, a lot of the challenge is that when we get really caught up in our research, we tend to be siloed into our individual research environments. And when we get caught up in that, it might be a very isolating experience for graduate students. But in LMP, with the mix of all of these different activities you can do in student life, you don't really get that sense of isolation. For example, right now I'm in my second year of my PhD training, and for me, I don't do a lot of time in courses anymore. And however, every week we have these LMP seminars on every Monday afternoons. And it was a great way for me to reconnect with the friends and see how they're doing and get a sense of what else is going on in the community. And these little things, you know, getting updates on what the social events are, what is the, you know, sports opportunities. For example, we have an indoor soccer club. These are just ways that you can really enrich your experience in the graduate, um, graduate school with a student life, with a community life. And I felt that was really encouraging for me. So aside from the student life experience in LMP, what really stood out is the phenomenal faculties and administrative staff. They really go out of their way to really make things work for you and they try to push you to succeed. And there are so many opportunities when I can recall on my own experience, when I try to apply for various awards, when I have a lot of you know, issues to discuss, I can just always knock on the doors of the office of Farzine, for example, and they're always available to answer my questions, answer my phone calls, and be patient with me to answer all my you know, sensitive issues about graduate school. 
And this really translates into the amount of, um, so this is a picture from the indoor soccer club that we have in LMP. And this really translates into the success that LMP students have uh, been receiving in terms of award. For example, the Vanya Canada Graduate Scholarship is the most prestigious doctoral award and its total amount of 50,000 per year for three years. And from its inception, a total of 15 LMP students have received this award. And just this last cycle, four students from U of T have received this award in the health category, one of them including myself. And besides the Vanya Award, but there are also other scholarships that LMP students can have achieved. For example, the Ontario Children's Scholarship, as well as the Connaught International Scholarship. And what's even crazier is that last year, one of our, um, one of our doctoral students, Dr. Mack, he actually received a Governor General's Award, and that's only awarded to the top um, academic students in the graduate department of Canadian universities. So from all these examples, we can see that LMP students do exceptionally well. And I think that a lot of it comes from individual success, but really it also comes from a support environment with phenomenal mentors and a supportive staff from the administrative team. So there's various ways to connect with LMP. So first, um, on the GLSE website, you can look up LMP ambassadors. So I myself is an LMP ambassador. And you can read up on our bio, read up our, um, where we came from, and also you can contact us if you have any questions. Secondly, we have open door sessions. So there's two dates available on March 18th on Wednesday and March 26th on Thursday. And last but not least, you can also contact us by visiting the LMP website, lmputorno.ca. And on our webpage, you can also see there's a lot of, um, a lot of um, information about our graduates, about our current students, and you can also read about profile, about some of the research that we're, that we're con currently uh, conducting. So last but not least, but we'll open the floor to any questions from the audience, and if I can get Sean to get up here too. So if there's any questions from the audience. Online. Okay. Yeah, then we can just answer some of the standard questions that we always frequently ask in LMP. So one common question that always comes up is, um, well, when's the application deadline? So before there was an early deadline of February 1st, but now, um, and there's the final deadline of June 1st. So all the application packages are due by June 1st every year. Um, one thing that I, one other question is, you know, do I have to find my own supervisor? And one thing that's really great about our department is the level of advocacy. And ultimately, the applicants are required to confirm a supervisor on their own, but the LMP department plays an important role um, in facilitating that transition and helping you to find a supervisor. So you're strongly you know, encouraged to perform your own search, but the department's got your back. Uh, another common question that I always ask is, where does the stipend come from? So every year, the base stipend of LMP students come from a mix of both the faculty as well as the LMP. And the base stipend is usually $25,800. Uh, $25, and however, students can also receive higher amounts in stipend per year through awards, as we mentioned earlier. Any other questions? Yes, yes. Dr. Benda. <laughs> what um, is the minimum admission criteria? What, what grade do you have to get to get into the LMP program? Usually it's around 80%, um, and I'm guessing that's cumulative, or that's in the last two years. It's in the last two years. And it's important to have biology classes. <laughs> that's a big help. <laughs> Yes? Uh, it's a stupid question, but... No, no. Sorry, it's a stupid question, but, uh, like, what is the difference between the master's and the PhD program? Like, you can get direct into the master's as well from the bachelor's, right? So, I mean, what is the difference between... Are, are, do you have to study in the master's, like, your courses, or do you, like, get into research directly, automatically? Actually, Harry, do you want to answer that? 
So uh, most students, when they finish the bachelor's program, would go into a master's. We do have the direct entry for PhD students in some special cases. In that case, we would look for students who not only have high grades and the right kinds of courses, but also students who have uh, research experience. So students who get direct entry to the PhD are often co-authors already on uh, different publications so that we're confident that when they come into the lab, they'll have some experience so they can hit the ground running. Uh, just to add to that, um, I came from a master's program and I transferred into my PhD in my second year. And the, the one of the differences is that you have to do, well, you do this PhD transfer exam, you get all these, you get your um, committee members and you invite other people from other departments to come in. Actually, uh, the graduate chair, Dr. L. Schultz, who just answered that question, was on my chair and he asked me some great questions. <laughs> I, I hope. <laughs> But um, it was it was it was scary. It was it would, but you know after you finish it, you really feel like you did something, and you really feel like you accomplished something. And it was like one of the hardest things I ever had to do. <laughs> but it was great. I really enjoyed the experience. So there was a question about rotations. So one question that we have is um, some students are asking, do we have a rotation program for classroom supervisors? So no, LMP does not have a rotation program. And however, we do encourage um, the students to have a sit-down interview with the professors and conduct a thorough interview before they select a uh, professor. Yeah. Dr. Bendek. <laughs> Can students start the graduate program early, for example, if they wanted to come and work as a summer student to get their feet wet in the lab? Um, I did that, and I was part of um, a summer internship before I started, and I felt that it was a great way to kind of get a sense of the lab before you begin. And um, I don't know, I just want to get ahead of the game, so because everyone's coming in in August or September, but when you start off in May, then you feel like you're ahead of the game, and you have more research to propose, and it really helps with scholarships as well, because then you land you land a publication early, and then when you apply for scholarships, it's a lot easier. So I would recommend it, but if you don't have it, then you know you still have a great experience here. Uh, can students uh, apply for uh, scholarships before actually uh, starting the working in a lab for graduate studies? Uh, I believe I believe yes. Yeah, you can definitely apply for a scholarship beforehand. Yeah, the CHR Master's Award I think is in uh, January, um, and you can apply the year before. Yeah, um, only, except the only exceptions are for certain awards where they do require sort of a, you know, who's your supervisor and what your research proposal is gonna, gonna be, then those are, you need to sort of define um, during your graduate, graduate school. Yeah. Supervisors um, appreciate if you come in with funding, but um, I mean, everyone here has a stipend and it's actually one of the best in the Faculty of Medicine here, so LMP department takes care of us. <laughs> Any more questions? Sorry, I'm just gonna add to your comments. So sure. just to be clear, the Faculty of Medicine has standardized, harmonized uh, oh. stipends for the entire faculty. However, uh, LMP students are guaranteed the funding through the duration of their program uh, regardless of how long that takes, mm -hmm. whereas some of the other programs may not fund you for your entire program. I see. So if, oh, one more question, okay. We have an online question. Okay, so there is a question about um, somebody's asking about what types of backgrounds do they need, like what type of education do they need to get into the program? So uh, this is a very specific question, so perhaps I will answer this directly to the uh, inquiry, but just in general to state that you do require a four-year Bachelor's of Science degree um, or a, an MD degree 
that is also a four-year degree. So essentially a four-year undergraduate degree is required to get into the master's program or the direct entry PhD. And for a PhD, uh, non-direct entry, you require masters from um, North America or the UK. Uh, there's no other questions. Uh, yes, one, one more. Question. Your last question wasn't stupid, by the way. It was great. <laughs> I liked it. There are no stupid questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when you're like, a, 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 like, for example, if I apply to the department, like, uh, for master's or PhD, right? If I do uh, my specialist in LMP, like graduate with a specialist, would you prefer that over majors or like is it the same thing? Um, I came from a uh, general background, a general biology at U of T Scarborough. And um, I think what's important is that you can demonstrate the, that you have the required knowledge. So you have an understanding of disease mechanisms, you have an understanding of molecular biology or techniques. You understand, let's say, maybe certain aspects of infection. Um, but when you come from, let's say, a specialist background, like what you would get in an LMP specialist, that undergraduate program is designed to prepare you for the kind of you know, trials and tribulations, the kind of challenges that you might get, different kinds of questions. I came from a general background, so I had a little bit of adapting to do. But, generally, but in general, coming from a um, specialist background, Gives you a gives you gives you an edge, um, Richard. Yeah. So on a similar note, so just like Sean, so I also came from a very general science background, and but I did have um, a lot of passion for you know doing science research to you know translate and also to see how diseases work in, in patients. So I think that if you can demonstrate that, it it, it will show and it it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Thank. You. So I think what we're looking for, especially in years three and four, is that you're taking upper level courses, 300 and 400 courses in areas that are going to be important for LMP. So just to get back to the other question, I think the LMP courses and the specialist program are tailored for the, to prepare you for the graduate program. But certainly if you have a strong background in courses like biochemistry, molecular cell biology, uh, physiology, genetics, genomics, uh, it, it doesn't really matter which university or department you've taken those courses. Uh, if you've got good grades on them, uh, those would be important considerations for admission. I guess. Yeah, so uh, if you're done for the question, just a final a reminder. So there's three ways to connect with LMP, JLSE website, and we're also having open door sessions on March 18th and March 26th. And last but not least, you can also visit us on the LMP website. So without any further note, I guess I'd like to thank everyone for being here and hope you will select LMP.